Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar, the channel where you could learn about new concepts in physics and astronomy. I am your host, Dr. Robitaille. Today, I'd like to talk to you about the standard model of the Sun. Remember, when we discuss this model, we are dealing with theory. Just like any theory, it must be questioned when new facts arise. Before starting, I strongly suggest watching this video on the history of the Sun. It will help you see how we got where we are today. In the standard model, the Sun is viewed as a fully compressible ideal gas. It has no true surface since gases are not known for their surface forming abilities. In this model, the central core of the Sun is believed to have a density approaching 150 grams per centimeter cube and reaches temperatures of 15 million Kelvin degrees. The density of the outer core is said to be about 20 grams per centimeter cubed. It is important to note that from helioseismic studies, astronomers know that the core of the Sun undergoes solid body rotations. Gases cannot rotate in that way. In the standard model, the core is thought to be the region where nuclear reactions take place. The Sun is limited to obtaining its vast majority of energy by directly converting hydrogen to helium. But a small amount of helium arises through intermediates, including beryllium, boron, and lithium. In all these cases, though, the end product is helium. The Sun is said to be unable to synthesize elements beyond the lightest, focusing only on the synthesis of helium. In this way, modern solar theory has crippled our Sun because it can't make any of the heavy elements. These are said to be generated in first generation stars. Since the core is proposed to be the site of nuclear reactions, it is endowed with the ability to emit light as gamma and x-rays, which are very high frequency. After gamma and x-rays are emitted by the solar core, they are believed to enter the radiative zone where they are repeatedly scattered, absorbed, and re-emitted. The radiative zone extends from just above the core to the next zone and is said to have a density of about 20 grams per centimeter cubed to 0.2 grams per centimeter cubed and a temperature ranging from 7 million degrees to 2 million degrees Kelvin. After millions of years in this zone, the trapped photons finally emerge. However, because of their constant interaction with intrastellar matter, their frequency is said to have slowly decreased, shifting from the X-ray range to the optical. As photons progress towards the surface of the Sun, they pass through the convective zone. We know from helioseismic measurements that the convective zone begins about 200,000 kilometers below the solar surface, where it is said to have a temperature of 2 million Kelvin degrees in the standard model. This is a region of the Sun where convection currents act to transport solar energy from the top of the radiative zone to the photosphere. Nested between the radiative zone and the convective zone, we find the tachyline layer. Once again, based on helioseismology, this is known to be a region of high shear forces within the Sun. This is an important region and we will discuss it in detail later. For now, suffice it to say that the mere existence of a tachyline layer is sufficient evidence that the body of the Sun cannot be gaseous. Different star types are believed to differ from the Sun by the size and content of their core, their radiative zone, and their convective zone. In the standard model, the photosphere is thought to have a temperature of about 5,700 degrees Kelvin. With an extremely low density, of only 2 times 10 to the minus 7 grams per centimeter cubed. This density is lower than those made in a laboratory vacuum. Once photons cross the photosphere, they make their way into outer space. Around the photosphere, we have the chromosphere with a calculated density in the standard model of about 10 to the minus 12 grams per centimeter cubed and a temperature slightly below on the order of the photosphere. That density is one one hundred thousandth of the density of the photosphere. Then comes the hypothesized transition zone. Here the temperature of the outer solar atmosphere is said to rapidly increase from about 10,000 Kelvin degrees to nearly one million Kelvin degrees. 
By the time the corona is reached, the density of the outer atmosphere is believed to have dropped to less than one millionth the value of the level at the chromosphere. In the corona, the temperature is thought to reach millions of degrees according to modern theory. Now that we've traveled from the core outward, let's look at the model as a whole. In the standard model, the Sun is viewed as a fully compressible object and is treated mathematically using the ideal gas law. This expression was first obtained by observing gases in containers. In this equation, P represents pressure, V volume, N amount of particles expressed in moles, R the, the gas constant, and T the temperature. Fixing the number of moles and the temperature makes the right side constant. In that case, increasing pressure will result in a decrease in volume, while increasing volume decreases pressure. Now the problem with utilizing the ideal gas law to treat the interior of a gaseous sun is relatively easy to explain. How do we define pressure? It's the amount of force applied to a given area. For instance, its units are often expressed as pounds per square inch or newtons per square meter for our friends outside the United States. Unfortunately, in the gaseous model of the Sun, there are no real surfaces by which pressure can even be defined. There is no area in the force over area definition of pressure, and that makes the ideal gas law unusable. Astronomers use imaginary surfaces in their model to skirt around this problem. But as will be seen below, this is not a solution. Homer Lane ignored this problem and applied the ideal gas law to the Sun in 1870. If the Sun truly has a fully gaseous interior, there are two problems. First, how do astronomers prevent the Sun from collapsing on itself? Secondly, how does a gaseous Sun maintain a stable radius? Remember that the rule in the laboratory is that a gas expands to fill the void, yet the Sun is stable. So how is that achieved if the Sun is truly a gas? Astronomers solve the stability problem by invoking a principle called hydrostatic equilibrium. It constitutes a balance between gravity, gas pressure, and radiation pressure. The birth of the standard model begins by considering gravity. Most of us recognize that there is more gravity on the Earth than on the Moon. We have all seen movies of Apollo astronauts bouncing around while they gaze at the Earth. The Sun has an incredible mass of 2 times 10 to the 30 kilograms. That's more than 300,000 times the mass of the Earth. The Sun is also unbelievably big. Inside its volume defined by the photosphere, one could fit over 1 million Earths. Despite its huge mass and volume, it is interesting to highlight that our star has a very ordinary density of only 1.4 grams per centimeter cubed which is close to the density of water at one gram per centimeter cubed and about one quarter of the density of the Earth. Given the mass of the Sun, it is not too much to believe that the surface gravity of our star is nearly 30 times that which we experience here on Earth. Astronomers argue that within each star, the inward directed force of gravity is counterbalanced by an externally directed gas pressure and radiation pressure. When all these forces balance, we have hydrostatic equilibrium. For a star the size of our Sun, theory suggests the gas pressure produced by electrons primarily acts to oppose the force of gravity. Within giant stars, however, radiation pressure becomes dominant. But for now, what is gas pressure? First, think about the atmosphere above the Earth. Gas pressure supports our atmosphere. As you remember from earlier, pressure is equal to force over area. Gas pressure is generated when an atom in our atmosphere strikes the surface of our planet. At that point, much like a billiard ball, it bounces off the surface and is redirected upward. The net result is that any movement of an atom downward is immediately transformed upward. You will note that in order to generate atmospheric gas pressure, we needed a true surface. However, in the standard model of the Sun, there is no surface, as we previously saw. Hervé Fay was the first to deprive the Sun of a true surface when he argued in 1865 that it was only apparent. He could not do otherwise given that he was promoting a gaseous solar body. 
Today, astronomers tell us that the surface of the Sun is nothing but an optical illusion. Given the theory that the Sun is just a ball of gas, they had no choice. Gases can never have a real surface. But if the Sun has no surface, and if its interior is fully gaseous, how could it generate gas pressure? After all, the only surfaces inside a gaseous Sun are imaginary. Still, if one studies classic textbooks of astronomy, like Clayton's, gas pressure will be discussed. In his textbook, Clayton uses an imaginary surface to argue that the interior of the Sun can support electron gas pressure. The problem, of course, is that imaginary surfaces are not real. Some insight into this question can be gained by returning to the billiard table. Each ball represents a gas particle. The bank of the table is a real surface. The angle at which the cue ball strikes the bank will be equal to the angle from which it leaves. There can be complete reversal of direction. But if the cue ball simply strikes another ball, then it will transfer momentum to the second ball and remain stationary after impact. From this example, it is easy to see why particles within a gaseous sun could never act like a true surface. Clayton's imaginary surface cannot be used to justify gas pressure in the sun. When a particle moves downward towards an imaginary plane, it will not undergo a change in direction upon reaching it. Imagine a particle in the sun moving downward and hitting another particle. It can simply push the second particle deeper into the solar body. This collision results in a downward force, not an upward one. There can be complete transfer momentum with no change in direction. Conversely, the opposite can be argued if the particle was initially moving upward. It is pretty clear that it is impossible to generate net gas pressure inside an object like a gaseous sun. No surface, no pressure. In fact, if one adds the force of gravity, gas particle movements inside a gaseous sun is more likely to generate solar collapse rather than a stable structure. Consequently, astronomers cannot justify the presence of electron gas pressure as a component of hydrostatic equilibrium within the sun. Then we come to radiation pressure. The escape of a photon from the center of the sun is said to involve perhaps millions of years of bouncing around within its interior. In a vacuum, light moves at 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. That's a lot of speed. To place everything in perspective, the width of the entire Milky Way galaxy is 100,000 light years. Assuming a light speed in a vacuum, this means that the standard model requires some of the light to travel 10 times the diameter of the galaxy, of which the Sun is only a tiny speck before escaping. But one of the biggest problems is invoking internal radiation in the first place. On Earth, objects strive for internal thermal equilibrium using conduction and convection, not radiation. Radiative processes are reserved for reaching equilibrium with the outside world. We will cover this concept further when I cover the zeroth law of thermodynamics. Consequently, the standard model of the Sun suffers from two flaws. Gas pressure cannot exist in the absence of a real surface, and there are none within a gaseous sun. Secondly, objects on Earth do not use radiative processes in trying to achieve internal thermal equilibrium. Conduction and convection are reserved for this situation. In our next video, we will begin by outlining some of the simplest proofs that the sun does indeed have a real surface. I hope you like this short introduction to the standard solar model and you will join me as we look more closely to the sun, the stars, and beyond. Once again, if you enjoyed this video, please leave a like. In addition, subscribe if you want to journey with me through space here at Skyscaller. Questions and comments are always welcome down below. I'll see you soon on our next video.